Welcome into the KSO Show. Mason Voth, KSU underscore fan, and Drew Galloway here with you. Ready to rock and roll after the Wildcats get another big win, 59-25. to And I'm not talking big in terms of, you know, momentum or just, you know, magnitude of the win. I'm talking big in the fact that they just keep scoring points left and right on terrible teams, and it's not really a close matchup. And K-State did that to Baylor. They immediately jumped out to a 35-7 to lead at that point. Um, you know, you're starting to ask yourself, is K-State going to score 100 points today? Uh, I didn't seriously ask myself that, but I did start to wonder how many points could they score. They slowed down. The game kind of got a little wonky there, uh, which has partly to do with Dave Aranda and just saying, well, we're down this big, like let's just do whatever we want. And I think that can sometimes be a, a bigger pain in the butt to defend than like a good team. And uh, we found that out when, when Baylor – Got the ball. It was 35-13. They recovered that onside, and you're like, man, they score here, and then they get the ball to start the second half. Could this turn into a game? K-State defense locked down. It wasn't a game. Baylor, just like everybody else, went for their garbage time touchdown. They got it there at the end, thanks to a review, and that's how we uh, totaled up to a 59-25 to final score. So with all that in mind, K-State now 7-3 and on the year. Uh I will go to Drew for his immediate takeaways from the win over Baylor. So, I mean, I, I think the instant takeaway, it's kind of like the last the last two home games. I, I just I don't think Baylor's any good at all. And I, I'd even raise it to, I know that they put up a fight offensively, but I think Baylor might be the worst team K-State's played all year. Uh, just, yeah, it never felt like the game was close the first drive for Baylor they were rolling but then it it was downhill from there if you were Baylor um the most impressive thing to me though I think again uh, was the passing game the seems like the the receivers have kind of gotten it figured out and Will Howard's playing really well lately and I know that we'll get into that later uh so it was all around just another like ho-hum beat the crap out of a bad opponent on, at home uh, for the season. You said that you were worried about or thinking about if Casey would get to 100 potentially. <laughs> I would, my, my thought was, huh, and the first half looked like they were going to outscore the basketball team from their game <laughs> on Friday night. <laughs> uh, that would have been, uh, well, I don't know. I, that would have either been a really good thing for people's sanity on the message boards about football, or it would have just started a, a new thread about how uh, disappointing the basketball team was on Friday night. So I don't know. I don't know what the right answer would have been in that situation. Uh, fan, what was your, your immediate takeaway from the the game with Baylor? It, it, it was, it was weird because uh, it's for stretches of the game. You, you mentioned that onside kick and Baylor kind of, seeming like they were sort of threatening and um, during the game I think uh, there were people that were saying we weren't playing very well and and it, it kind of felt like that and, and especially special teams maybe but uh, this is uh, offense ended up at 4.75 points per drive the fourth straight home game with four points per drive or better for K-State's offense which is pretty significant since K State's gotten four points per drive twelve times in the climbing era. They did it four times this year. So, uh, very impressive uh, offensive performance. Defense, you know, did what they needed to. The kind of the typical Klanderman adjustment. You know, Baylor looked like they were just going to move the ball all day. The first drive, you know, averaged I think fourteen yards per play, and then uh, the defense got that short up. Um, did what they needed to do. Um, I'll give credit. Baylor's offense, some credit. I think they came with some fight. I don't know that I would say that about their defense, but their offense did play with some fight. Um, it was funny. Um, during the game, um, at the end of the game, afterwards, uh, they were talking about on the radio broadcast how Baylor, like at the end of the game, like 12 of their players were standing. The entire team was just sitting on benches watching. <laughs> And they, and they were talking about how that just doesn't happen in college football and wondering what in the world is going on with Dave Aranda in that program because it's looking like it's not going very well. Well, uh, I could tell them what's going on with Dave Aranda and Baylor football. It's that <laughs> Dave Aranda is a fraud. We all know this. Um, yeah, well, 
I I heard I heard some I heard some conversations uh, well well after the, the building had cleared out on uh, Saturday night and there were just a few people left in the press box and uh, somebody came by and uh, basically I think uh, their words were uh, I was sitting there going what the hell are you thinking Dave with as many times as they were throwing the football and going back to pass and uh, I think I mean it's not just I think Baylor players that are probably shocked at how this season's played out. But I also think that everybody around the league is looking at like, what are you doing? And you're kind of just torpedoing uh, any chances and you're just making things worse. I mean, they, they Baylor kept doing things to, to put themselves in tough spots. So I don't know. They, they're not a good team right now. They're just, they're not. And I like watching that and the way it started, that, that almost makes me think that Baylor is the worst team we've seen K-State play this season. <laughs> Oh, yeah. I think they are. I think they definitely are. The and metrics, it, the metrics say they are. And it just doesn't make any sense how then that they were able to at least win a couple of games, uh, because I mean they're fortunate that UCF was playing a backup quarterback and had a monumental mm-hmm. collapse, and I guess then that they played Cincinnati, um, <laughs> so who we know is the worst team in the league. K State just doesn't get the benefit of playing them. If if K State and Cincinnati played tomorrow. What would the score prediction from you guys be? Where's the game at? <laughs> yeah, they're better at home. It's in Manhattan. It's in Manhattan, just for comedy's sake. Oh, well, K State would score forty. I think yeah. we we yeah. could say that. Although Cincy did just beat Houston, so yeah. <laughs> I, well, I, I you don't like, want to catch Cincinnati at the wrong time. <laughs> I'll say like forty-eight ten. Mm-hmm. Uh, I don't think Cincinnati would score ten points in that game. I, well, they'd score on they'd score another garbage TD like every other home team tries. That, to no, that's probably true. That's probably a good point. Uh, but yeah, it's I don't know, just one of those deals where uh, I, just, I, I Cincinnati's I, one and five at home and two and two on the road. By the way, well, so, Baylor was two and zero oh on the road. Yeah, and Baylor was two and zero oh on the road. They're now two and one. Yeah, and had never lost a game on the road this season. That's just uh, you know. K State had had the uh, the the secret serum there to get the job done. Uh, did, you, did you guys think that it was weird that Blake Shapin was still in the game in the fourth quarter? N- no, here's the deal. And this came up after the game. I think I was when I was in the back and talking with like TJ from KWCH and, and Zach from Go Power Cat, and lo- they, they one of them looked down and made a comment about how Blake Shapin ended up throwing for four touchdowns in the game. I think he was in the game as like a reward from Dave Aranda. It's like, yeah, look, we suck and we're not doing anything. So we're just going to give you the the chance to pad your stats and load up on touchdowns and yards. And everything. I mean, he threw the ball 45 times. There's really no need for that. Um, but I, I do think it was just one of those where it's like, hey, go out there, do some things, be good, have the time of your life. Uh, the time of your life. So I, you know, that's I think that's what happened there. I don't think that there was any thought of like preserving him. And also, Dave Aranda probably looks at him, he's like, if we're here next year, we probably need a better quarterback than Blake Shapin. And it's not even been Blake Shapin's fault this year that Baylor has been this bad. Um, I was impressed by the stat that the ESPN Plus broadcast threw up that said Baylor has, I think it was 17 starts this year on their offensive line from freshmen and the rest of the big 12 combined. So, you know, 13 other teams only had two. And that was a, uh, a pretty good indicator of where Baylor's struggles have been. And obviously Shapin's missed time because he's gotten himself killed and all that. So I don't know. I look, the, the biggest thing that stood out to me is that everybody came out pretty focused. I mean, the defense gave up that first touchdown uh, but Baylor, I think it was just kind of tough to to get an idea of what they were going to do. Uh, but after that, they settled in. They obviously made enough plays. They're starting to get some turnovers, which is huge. And then offensively, yeah, I would have liked more points. And there was a stretch where I was like, yeah, this you know, this kind of stinks that it's it's pausing. But they, when you score that many so quickly and they made it look easy going down the field. Like Will Howard instantly had the record that he was chasing in the game. I, I I don't think that there's much of a big deal. So I think the way that they came out and yet again just took care of a really bad team is impressive because the more and more we go throughout this season, like we can question it and we can laugh at it that K State is now seven and three. 
and they haven't Troy is probably the best team they've beaten this season. Mm -hmm. But there are a bunch of other teams in the Big 12 now that have played around and been dangerously close or have lost to what we consider bad teams. I mean, UCF just killed Oklahoma State yesterday. OU about lost at home to UCF. Obviously, KU just lost to Texas Tech yesterday. Uh, Texas has been dangerously close with Houston and TCU now. Um, now, you know, the TCU thing was a little bit more backdoory, but the Houston thing was, was very real. So everybody in this league has had issues and struggles with what we would consider bad teams, except for K-State. They've just gone and, and dominated them. And it really is one of those things, I mean, you bring up with K-State or Cincinnati being Manhattan with how K-State plays. It is unfortunate how the schedule has worked out this year where K-State's toughest games have been on the road. And now, unfortunately, like you still got to win them. That's not an excuse, but it is it is how it works out for you. I mean, I think if Texas plays in Manhattan last week, with everything considered, K-State probably wins that game. I think, obviously, the game at Missouri, which doesn't matter for conference play, but K-State's not losing that game in Manhattan. Uh, we saw what they did in Manhattan the year before. And Oklahoma State, same type of deal. I mean, I was talking with with Alec yesterday because he was sitting around all day waiting for Iowa State to kick off at, at 9.15 in, in Provo. And like got, we got to talking about, I think one of the things that was the biggest killer for K-State against Oklahoma State is that, number one, it's a weird Friday game out of that bye week. But when you when you kick off that late, you're just sitting around the hotel room waiting all day and I think that that can start to mess with you from uh, like you don't know what to do you're probably wearing yourself out by not doing anything because you're thinking like there's just so many weird things so this, these are not excuses for why K-State lost these games they they lost them and they made mistakes in those games that they easily could not have made and could have won the game but it is just one of those deals that they they have to deal with things as the road team that the the other team doesn't uh, and the breaks just didn't go their way with the way the schedule worked out this year. Um, it's the same type of thing that they're going to face next week playing in Lawrence, where uh, they just it's they have one different element than what KU has. So um, I think the fact that they were able to go out, take care of business against Baylor, just dominate these bad teams, it also kind of just illustrates how weak the home schedule was this year. Uh, K State didn't get many benefits with that, so. I don't know. Just uh, a couple of things to kind of consider and, and take a look at. Uh, moving on, people were wanting to worry about the offense, the defense at very various points yesterday. Where is the actual cause for concern on this team? I mean, I think we all probably know what the biggest issue was yesterday, uh, but how, how much is that going to impact them moving forward and that being special teams? Yeah, it depends on what factor you put on that for winning and losing. You know, I mean, all coaches are going to say all three phases are important and they're equally weighted and all that. But I, I do think the the true impact of special teams generally in most games is not one third of the game. It's probably less than that, maybe 20 percent or 15 percent or something. Uh, but you do, you know, you give up a huge punt return. Uh, you have a negative punt return of your own. You basically get beat on a fake field goal in an obvious fake field goal situation, but um, the, the ball's thrown a little long. Um, uh, onside kick. I mean, you have several mistakes that were pretty costly that were the only reason Baylor was even breathing going into halftime. So I would say it's a, it's a concern, you know, Tennant did make his field goal, so you know the up and down roller coaster of Chris Tennant is still going. Um, so you just never know at the end of the game what, what, what you're going to get with that. And then uh, you know, just K State's return game is not what we expect it to be. You know, you're, we're used to to return touchdowns, and and we don't we haven't really been close this year. So it is a concern. I don't I don't know if it's going to make a difference between KU and Iowa State or in the bowl game, or even if. We, by chance we make to Arlington. So we'll see, but I, I do think it's, a, it's the b biggest concern for this team. I, I do think yesterday was the best. We saw the kick return game, at least yeah. Trayshawn Ward back there. Um, 
I just don't know that that's going to matter. I, I've kind of just counted against it this year. I don't think it's going to happen. I think <laughs> your best bet in making special teams plays comes with when they see something in terms of trying to block a kick because yesterday they didn't even have to block it. They could just tackle the punter thanks to a bad snap. Yeah. But they were coming after punts yesterday. So when they do that, it's typically because, uh, hey, we know we got something. Um, but, yeah, the special team stuff is concerning. It's It continues to be an issue. And – I'll downplay it to some extent. Like it's fun to get the kick returns. It's nice and easy, but it doesn't really, you know, over the long haul, it's not going to have the biggest impact. You'd rather be what they are on offense and yep. will hopefully be on defense. Um, but it just does kind of stink to see how far it's fallen. And the fact that not only has it fallen off from K-State's production side, but that they now seem to be giving ground on the other side where – it felt like I never saw anybody through the first 20 years of my life have success with their special teams against K-State. And now it feels like for the long, you know, the longest stretch here, the only successful special team stuff we're seeing is coming from the opponent against K-State. And that's having the impact in games. K-State's not making the impact. I think that's the one thing that they probably have to focus a little bit more on. Um, and I, I would be interested to know kind of, what the philosophy and the idea of Chris Kleiman is with this, because I can't imagine that he's just turned like a total blind eye to it. And like, yeah, we're just going to kind of half-ass it here, whatever. Um, but a lot of the results tend to make me believe that it's not a priority. And I'm not saying it has to be like Bill Snyder level priority, but I would <laughs> at least like to see a little bit more give a damn because I think a lot of the mistakes that they made yesterday is because they lack give a damn in the special teams department. Yeah. I mean, it, it, it's concerning, but kind of like what fan said, like I think that this team and even last year's team is good enough to overcome a lot of special teams mistakes. I mean, we, we brought up everything that Baylor did yesterday on special teams. And I think they still only scored six points on all after all of that. Like, this team can cover up the flaws on offense and defense. And like Mason said, I'd rather be good on good to great on defense and offense than be elite on special teams because that just covers up a lot of flaws. So, I, get, I mean, it, it, it's concerning that they keep allowing a big return, but I, I'm also in the, in the same kind of vein of, like, it didn't really matter a whole lot yesterday. And I don't know how much it's going to matter going forward because Iowa State special teams are not great and KUs aren't that great either. So, like, it's maybe a concern, but, I mean, it, it was it was not great yesterday. But, I mean, the onside kick, they even had everybody there but just missed the ball. Yeah, well, that that's a problem, too. If you're there, you, you can't miss the ball. That's uh... – you got to get you, you got to get that at least taken care of. So I don't know. I I think that's really the only thing because yesterday everything else, I don't know. Like I said earlier, when Baylor is that far out of it early and they're just there's no rhyme or reason to what they're doing, as evidenced by the two point conversions and everything else. I think that gets really tough if you're Joe Klanderman to to defend in some ways. And like I guess it's not an excuse, but. Uh, I would I would rather see K State have to defend a good team than a team that is has zero hope at all. So they're just chucking and ducking whatever uh, because you, you you can't do anything to prepare for that. Anything could happen on it. You just have to rely on guys to make plays, which ultimately the K State defense did make a considerable amount of yesterday. So that worked out. All is good for them. All right, let's uh, roll on here. Continue with everything else going down. Uh, we gotta we gotta talk about Will Howard and the uh, now all time career passing touchdown leader at K State. Uh, just a, an honor that we expected him to get from the start of his career. We knew, you know, after the 2021 season, I think we all looked at that Texas game and said that guy is going to have a a career record at K State for touchdown passes. And uh, obviously, that's a joke. None of us expected that. But now, <laughs> over the course of the last two seasons, Will Howard has exploded and, and broken out. Uh, over the last two years, Will Howard is, now has a 36-12 to touchdown-to-interception ratio at K-State. 
And in basically the last, I guess it would be, uh, well, he's played 17 games now, basically. Uh, in his last 17, he's thrown for right around 3,800 yards. So he's he's tearing it up. He's doing some awesome things right now. Uh, what do you guys make of Will Howard, the the new touchdown record holder at K-State? Well, he uh, he's played well lately. It's, that's kind of the expectation that we had um, going into the season of what we'd see all year. Um, you know, the low point was obviously Oklahoma State and the struggles he had in that game. And, and then, you know, Texas Tech as well, getting taken over um, basically by Avery Johnson in that game. But since then, I think he's kind of responded, you know, as, as we would hope he responded. I do, I do think a part of it is the wide receiver room coming together with Jace Brown, Phillips Brooks, and Keegan Johnson, um, especially uh, Johnson and Bro uh, Brown getting healthy and getting the type of reps um, and, and getting that cohesion. You know, you also had been sent, injured for a game and or so, and so having those four primary pass catchers come together, uh, Jaden Jackson still has his part. Uh, R.J. Garcia has kind of fallen down the list, but he's still in the mix there. So I think that's a big part of it. But it's really impressive to see him achieve this. Um, and like you said, it's not a career award. It's it's a guy that's really done a lot in the last two years, um, been impressive, and um, is is really playing well to finish this season, which is good to see as, as we go down the stretch into the final two games. Yeah, anyone that calls this like a lifetime achievement award is just doesn't know what they're talking about. I mean, that he's at 36 in the last two years with still three, potentially even four games to go. It's like you could look at this where he could have broken the record just in two years. So, I mean, it, he's playing really, really, really well right now. Um, yesterday was, again, like you, you say this after the last uh, – couple games now where it's like oh that was one of will howard's best games of his career where the ball was in the right spot every time he didn't really try to force the issue the only real uh bad throw i thought that he had was the one right before halftime uh, that led to them just running the ball on third down where it could have gotten intercepted but right, he was putting the ball in the right spot he he looks a lot more confident again and it's kind of like where the last few I'd say three games have been like the Will Howard of last year. We're just coming out and throwing the ball around and having a fun, and having fun. And uh, it, it's never a bad thing to break a school record. So I, I don't really understand the whole, Oh, well, why are you guys putting this out? Cause the record is so low. Well, if the record was so low, somebody would have beaten it before yesterday. That, Absolutely. That is, that is my biggest point with it is look for as look, there have been a lot of good quarterbacks at K state and we know obviously that their skill set most of the time was geared a little bit towards running, but somebody has to have that record, whether it's an easy one or not, somebody has got to have it. And at the end of the day, when you look back at it, it's going to make sense that a guy that won you a Big 12 title holds your touchdown passes record. It's, I mean, I compare I compare the K-State touchdown passes record to the Royals single season home run record, where for the longest time, it was like 36, and it was Steve Balboni, and the Royals were like one of two teams that had never had a player hit 40 home runs in a season. It's like, gee, many Christmas. You've had all these, you've had these good players, like guys we could actually talk about, and it's like Steve Balboni, who was, you know, he's not even like a – people don't think of him as a, as a royal. They just think of him as a guy that played professional baseball. <laughs> but then Jorge Soler came along, and we know Jorge Soler can mash. He did it, finally got over that hump. I guess, you know, Moustakis broke it in between there, still under 40. But the record's still relatively low. Salvador Perez comes in, he ties it, and it's like, oh, that makes sense. That makes sense that Salvador Perez would have your single-season record because World Series MVP – like face of your franchise for over a decade, totally makes sense. And at the end of the day, for as up and down as the Will Howard stuff has been, that guy won a Big 12 title for K-State at quarterback, and it makes sense that we're going to look up, and who knows how long it lasts. Like maybe things change in this offense. Like we keep seeing guys chuck it, and maybe 
Three years from now, we are ta- we are talking about Avery Johnson holding that record. But for right now, Will Howard got it, and Colin Klein didn't get it. Michael Bishop didn't get it. L. Roberson didn't get it. Colin- all these guys did not get it. Josh Freeman, who they were just like, throw it all over the place. Blake Shapin style, they were like, throw it all over the place. We have nothing else going for us. Do whatever. He didn't do it. And uh, this this is this is a significant thing, despite the fact that it's low. So there should be no uh, distaste or anything towards Will Howard for this record. And it is it is a big deal when somebody breaks a record like that. So I just I want that to be out there because I think that they're um, I don't know I, I've seen some of the same sentiment and everything else. And there are a lot of other guys that they could have easily gone out there, and if they wanted to to do it for their career, they could have done it. And another notable thing is that for three of these seasons, for it being a Lifetime Achievement Award, Will Howard had one of, what, one of probably the second best running back in school history on his team, and he was still throwing for touchdown passes. And Deuce was still getting his touchdowns in that mix. So that is also a highlight of how good the K-State offense has been, namely the last two seasons under Colin Klein, uh, because I went back and watched Will Howard's first touchdown pass of his career. Uh, you guys, anybody know who caught the first touchdown of Will Howard's career? Sebastian Taylor. Oh man, I wish, but no. <laughs> Deuce Vaughn. It was Deuce Vaughn, seventy yards to beat Texas Tech. And watching the highlights from that game, I thought, man, how far has this offense come from Courtney Messingham? Where it was like, yeah, every third and ten, we're just going to hand it off to Deuce and just cross our fingers and hope. <laughs> and I like that's that's another indication like this record as much as it belongs to Will Howard it does also belong to Colin Klein for kind of revolutionizing and changing the way K-State plays offense and putting them in a position to where they can win at a much higher level than what they would have ever done under Courtney Messingham who like overall you look at it it's not like it was terrible under him it's just I don't think there was much feel there from Mess and I think he was content with just being average and Colin Klein has come in and realized that you can do a lot more than average at K-State. So uh, I think that's impressive. Somebody also pointed out in a uh, post-game last night, uh, in the Will Howard press conference even, and said that uh, last night Will tied uh, the most three touchdown passing games at, at K-State in his career. Like yeah. They, they, they've come in bunches, but, I mean, I mean we all kind of, hinted that the last two years that really hit, but we were, we were talking before recording, he threw one touchdown pass in 2021. It's like, yeah, the last I was just, two years. yeah, I was just going to add his first two years, he played 15 games and had nine touchdowns and really wasn't asked to throw. And, and if you look at the career leaders, Bishop, the guys up there with him, Bishop may and Jake waters, <clears throat> those guys basically played two seasons and averaged 1.5 to 1.6 touchdowns per game. And then the last two seasons, when Will became the primary guy and a thrower, he's averaged over 2.1 touchdowns per game. So for his career, he's at 1.4, so he's not far below those guys. And he, the two, first two years, he was not asked to be a thrower. That's only really come the last two years. And if, if you're having, averaging two touchdowns a game at K-State over a two-year period, um, that's a significant number. That's, that's an impressive number, too. Mason, we're still very much alive for uh, breaking the, the single – single season TD record too. Yeah. Yeah. Nope. We're back on track, baby. Uh, I mean, really, you know, the way he's going right now, he could at least tie it next week against KU. Uh, so that is, uh, the hope I guess is that the, the record comes and I, I still end up looking like a genius or something at, uh, some point this season. It's, it isn't like likely, I guess, next week. I think I just want that to be put out there. Uh, I do think that it's there's probably a good chance that K State just pounds the ball relentlessly. Uh, but, you know, I mean, to, to be a fair, guy can we, dream. To be fair, we thought that that would happen a lot this week, too. That's true. But I, I still thought that they, that he would get the record this week. Like I, I figured very similar to what we saw yesterday with some of like the, the little cutesy, like, inside the 10 yard line touchdown stuff i did expect that to happen um so but next week i think it's just going to be whatever you have to do when it all costs and go go rip the heck out of ku but very impressive what will howard was able to do and i think that more people should respect the record than what they ultimately will um 
and I, you know, I get it. It's, it's fine. You have a lot of preconceived notions about what Will Howard was. I did too. Um, I cert like, I will be very transparent in every way because, you know, this is how everybody probably is. Um, I was, I said some very disparaging things about Will Howard the first two years of his career, namely comparing him to Carson Wentz. He's a far better quarterback than Carson Wentz ever was. I just want that to be out there. Uh, but also, I remember sitting in Fort Worth last year. Adrian gets hurt, and I just look at Alec Bussey, RIP, not dead. And I said, I said, oh boy, get ready for this show. And what do you know? He came out there, and uh, it, it turned into something. Show. It yeah, it turned into something very impressive. All right, here is a look at uh, Will Howard and his touchdown passes by uh, receivers and how it's worked out. Uh, anybody on there that stands out or anything notable that is kind of wacky to you with how that, that went down? Um, I'll say that it's – I mean, we kind of hit on it yesterday because I, I made the joke that he was going to be the one to catch it. Christian Moore is the one that is kind of like a huh. – mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, no, that's probably – that is probably going to be the most obscure one. Uh, also, the fact that – this in this year alone, four fullbacks or tight ends have caught touchdown passes from him. Uh, and I was when I was kind of going through to do the research on this. Um, in this season alone, let's see, he has thrown a touchdown pass to eight different players. Um, so Jaden Jackson, DJ Giddens, Jace Brown. Um, let's see, yeah, I think something along those lines. Like it's it is a wild number. Uh, the the way that like. K State's offense has just kind of come alive. Yeah, eight different guys this like eight new guys this season. So, kind of a a weird quirk with how everything has worked out for him. Uh, but yeah, a pretty he loves scoring the tight ends and fullbacks. I think well, that's, that's seven different tight ends and slash fullbacks. I got six. Yeah, that's, yeah. Senate Wheeler oh, seven Wheeler. Yeah, um, yeah. <clears throat> Sammy Wheeler. That guy found himself open. Uh, enough for for Will Howard, so yeah, that's, uh, I don't know. Just I, I kind of unique to look at and uh, fascinating to see uh, how the breakdown ends up working out, um, and we'll see how how this gets added to as the the season progresses and where things go next for K State. Um, so yeah, just a, a quick little thing there. All right, uh, other notes from this game for K State this weekend. Uh, Offensively, everything seemed to be kind of back in working order. And on the defensive side of the ball, we know that the conversation around turnovers a lot of time can talk, can kind of go into it. You know, was it luck or was it actual success that you had? Where would we grade how repeatable K State's performance in forcing turnovers the last two weeks against Texas and Baylor is next week against KU? Because that's really what matters here, not. You know, how do they do it, all that stuff? It's can they repeat it yet again next week against KU, who might be playing a third-string quarterback that's a walk-on? Yes, I, I I, think they can just because of <clears> – <throat> I think they can if it's their second-string quarterback who tends to yeah. make those kind of mistakes as well. So I, I do think <clears throat> they K-State's defense is – the secondary has gotten better at just being – sound in, in what the scheme is asking them to do. Um, they're not necessarily better at catching the football, but if you get your hands on footballs enough, eventually you're going to have one stick in your hands. And I think that's kind of what we've seen happen because, you know, I'd, the interception rate compared to getting hands on balls rate is still probably 33% or something like that the last couple games. But <clears throat> we're definitely getting those opportunities, and eventually those guys are going to catch a ball. Yeah, leave it to the former offensive player to be the one to actually catch one. Uh, I mean, I, turnovers are a lot of luck, but I also think that you force kind of your own luck. So if yeah. if if, if, if you keep <coughs> too aggressive, um, then I I feel like eventually like they could have another good game. I don't I don't know if they'll force four again, especially like you look at uh, three fumbles by Baylor, all recovered by K State. Yeah, yeah. So it, I I don't know how sustainable that is, but I mean, they're in the right spots every time teams seem to throw it. 
they just don't always catch it. I mean, I, I know that we made the joke that, uh, of course, Marquis Siegel caught the two-point conversion interception. Which, <laughs> hey, I said it. It was coming this week. It, it finally happened. It doesn't count uh, in the stats, but it happened. So, I mean, it, they get a lot of hands on the ball, and that's all you can really ask for. Um, I, I It is just funny, though, to me that out of all of the ones the last few weeks that they've had their hands on, probably the toughest play was the one that Keenan Garber made, the former offensive guy. And, of, mm-hmm. course, of course, he made the play and then scored. Yeah. Uh, yeah, no, I, I think uh, it's funny that he was finally able to do that. I'm glad it happened for him. You come to a school as a receiver, you think, yeah, I'm going to catch a couple touchdown passes while I'm there. And he finally did. It just it was Blake Shapen throwing it to him, not Skylar Thompson or Will Howard, like he probably thought it would end up being. So uh, that that was fun to see. And I, I just think I think confidence is a big thing with the defense. And I think that there was a stretch there where there probably wasn't much confidence that they could do it. They were playing well enough to get teams off the field. I mean, we talked about that all year long. Like the Oklahoma State game, they they only gave up one touchdown in that game, and they held them to a bunch of field goals. So they did most of their job but they couldn't get that big play to turn the game around. It's like the same thing at Missouri this year. They couldn't get a big play that just halted things and gave serious momentum to K-State. Now they are starting to do that. I mean, I I don't think it's going to be as easy as what Baylor and Texas made it in giving the turnovers the last couple of weeks, or I guess, you know, going back to the Texas Tech game and how that played out. But I do think that K-State is in a good spot, and I think confidence is a big part of being able to force more and more turnovers. So I feel good about where things are heading right now uh, for K-State and everything else. After uh, 17 yeah. turnovers forced now on the season. No, well, how about yeah, that, that? That's after not having one in the first two games. Yeah, it took them a while to get going, uh, but you know, it's it's not about how you start. It's about how you finish. So whatever cliche you want to throw out about how this has worked out well for K-State. Let's see, real quick on the the turnover thing, I wanted to go see if uh, I could see just uh, how many, uh, where they stack up in the Big 12. K-State's now sixth in the Big 12, or actually tied for fifth in the Big 12 in interceptions at 10. Um, So that is significant, I guess. Um, I, I can't really find like fumbles or anything right now. So I'm not even going to mess with it. We're fourth overall, 17 gained. Okay. There you go. Uh, And then third in margin. K-State, they got their first – they got the defensive touchdown yesterday. actually got two of them. Uh, Now they they might finally be getting close to catching KU, who inexplicably has three uh, three interceptions for touchdowns this year, and they also have the fumble. So Mm -hmm. KU is like four or five defensive touchdowns this season. Thinking about next week's game real quick on that front, uh, we mentioned it a little bit about how the, you know, things could play out with K-State's defense forcing turnovers, but how likely is it that K-State limiting their turnovers plays a factor in this game? Because KU is obviously talented enough to force them. That's how they've made their hay in a lot of their big wins this year is they've gotten significant plays at the right time defensively and uh, how likely is it that K-State can avoid that next week against KU? Um, I, I it, That's just hard to say, I think, because of like what we talk about with turnover luck. But I, I do think that it, it, it will matter a lot uh, for next week. I mean, you look at the three losses. I had two of the three losses, you were minus in the turnover margin. And I, I, think, that, I think that that's very significant, especially when you're on the road. Uh, so, and... and at, at this point, like not knowing what KU's quarterback situation is going to look like, uh, a turnover could be something that gives them life if Jason Bean doesn't play and Jalen Daniels don't play. Yeah, I, I agree. It's hard to say. Um, <clears throat> KU's got 10 interceptions as well, so um, that's tied with us. So they definitely have the potential to do it. They've definitely done it pretty well. It's, you know, the probably the strength of their defense has been – getting in position to force some turnovers. So <clears throat> I would say if they want to win the game, they've got to win turnovers by at least two, maybe at least one, probably two or more uh, margin wise, I, I think for them to beat us. I, and I would say that even with being a quarterback and I don't, I mean, the threat of Daniels is something, but he hasn't played in what two months. Yeah. So I don't see him being 
some superstar coming off the bench that really hasn't done much for a long time. So I think their biggest threat at quarterback would be a healthy Jason Bean against us. Um, <clears throat> but the turnover factor will be part of the game for sure. Yeah, I mean, I think <laughs> that that's the that would be the biggest concern because that really is like, why did KU beat BYU? It's because the defense scored two touchdowns for them. Um, how did they get the jump on Oklahoma early? It was they they had the pick six on on Dylan Gabriel, uh, and they were able to have defense come through in game after game when it, it would have been close or maybe gone the other way, but defense has been the savior for them. And yesterday, even despite how ugly Tech's offense was, they never had that that massive play that really flipped things around. So I think it'll be interesting to see. Uh We'll we'll kind of continue to hit a little bit more on on the KU game uh, because it is so important and people will be so interested in it. Obviously, the biggest thing we know is KU's run defense is still very 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 bad, and K State obviously has the capable runners and Giddens and Ward. And then do you use, do you use Avery Johnson in any fashion next week uh, in a in a more heavy set than what you had? Obviously, this past week he only I think saw the field in you know garbage time at the end. So what it what should the expectation be on the ground for K State next weekend against KU and and how easy should it come for them? Well, I I don't know if easy is the right word, but I think that you'll see K State probably rely on the run game even more than they have the last few games. I mean, obviously, like they couldn't with Texas. It'll probably be more similar to kind of how the TCU game played out where you see a lot of runs, a lot of diversity in the run game. Because KU's uh, run defense is just not very good. I mean, you could make an argument that Tosh Brooks didn't touch the ball enough yesterday, and he still had uh, 33 carries. But like, the, what's different about K-State than Texas Tech <laughs> is, is the diversity in the run game and being able to use both running backs. So I, I think that both running backs could have a big day. I, I don't know if will if you can take Will Howard out right now to put Avery Johnson in. Yeah, um, I will say that the last two games, KU did hold Iowa State to two point six yards per carry. They held uh, Texas Tech to three point one yards per carry. So they have played well the last couple weeks. Um, <clears throat> and Texas Tech is a legitimate running game with a legitimate bag. I don't. Iowa State ran all over BYU, but they they're not a great running team. So we, they have played well lately. You know, the four games before that, they allowed 4.9 yards per carry or more to Oklahoma, Oklahoma State, UCF, and Texas. So any good running team they've played, any really good running team they've played has, has run the ball well against them. But I think, you know, last yesterday's game was a game of balance. I think it was 26 <clears throat> passes for K, 26 runs for K-State and 27 passes, or I may have those flipped. And similar success rate for each. So I think – Colin Klein will seek to be balanced because I do think you can exploit <clears throat> what KU is going to give you. Because you never know. I mean, what what is KU going to try to take away? I mean, uh, you, you've heard coaches say before, any team can take something away, but what are they going to give you give you when they try to do that? So I, I do think I would guess KU's plan will be to take K State's running game away, make the passing game beat them, and then hope for those interceptions that, that they kind of relied on to to win some Big 12 games. So I, I would guess that will be their plan coming into our game and then give Devin Neal the ball 35 times if they're smart and then see what happens. <clears throat> yeah, I, I think we're going to see a lot. Both sides really put as much, you know, effort as they can into uh, trying to run the football and just not giving up about it. But – it may be a game where both are so convinced that they can do it and uh, they they have to go to the air. And obviously, if, if this is an aerial assault uh, this this coming week, you like K-State's chances better given the way that the quarterback situation is right now and the fact that KU had some of their main pass catchers get banged up and uh, we'll have to see what the status is for them. I mean, I for KU, and I don't feel bad for him because why should I? But this was not an ideal previous game for them to play as they get ready for their biggest game of the year in in all you know circumstances because you got 
you know, your backup quarterback banged up. You got his pass catchers banged up. Like there's just a lot of questions now that go into it. And for K state, Jake Clifton is the one that really, really hurts. I think, especially because uh, you'd like to be at full strength or as close to it when uh, you're facing a team like KU and, you know, and talking about linebackers. Uh, and then we'll see what happens with the Khalid Duke situation. Uh, defensively for K-State, though, we know that they've been susceptible to explosive run plays. And KU obviously has the the, the tandem to do it uh, with Highshaw and Neal. So what, what should we expect from KU's offense versus K-State's defense this coming week? I think that kind of like what we saw with Baylor, you'll see KU pull out all the stops. I mean, it, this is a big game for both sides. And, I mean, the KU players that are currently on the team probably aren't even old enough to remember the, the last time that uh, KU beat K-State. And I think this is kind of like, a, in a way, this is kind of like the Oklahoma game with KU where it, it's like the – this is the – biggest game of the season coming in and they're going to plot all the stops and try and try and beat them. I mean, it, you, you'll probably see like a surprise onside kick, a fake punt again. So that you, you kind of look at it where from a K-State perspective, like, like this game against Baylor was probably a good test because you, you saw a fake field goal. You, you saw a surprise onside kick. You saw multiple trick plays. So it, it'll be interesting to see kind of what KU does because they, they are extremely, extremely diverse in how they go about their offense. So it'll be interesting to see if they have like any new wrinkles next week too. Yeah, that I'd say the concern is the number of formations and, and like you said, Drew, the, the diversity of scheme KU uses in their running game. And they really count on getting you messed up in your, in your gaps and your fits because of the weird formations they like to use, which is just smart football. Um, they do have a great offense coordinator. I think he's legitimately one of the best in the league. And uh, you, we've seen that with kind of their plug and play of quarterbacks. Um, you know, everybody thought with Daniels out, they would fall off. And they've really, um, up until yesterday, maintained pretty good <clears throat> offense without him. What I would consider one of the best top three offenses in the league with us in Texas. So um, we'll see how they, they come out against us. Um, you know, the, the the quarterback factor does make a difference, I think, going into the game. Although I, I do think if Ballard does have to play, that limits a lot of what they can do. Um, even, even though Bean has been prone to make mistakes, he is also a very, very uh, experienced quarterback that has made lots of plays uh, and played a lot of games uh, in his career. So I think that, that factors in as well. He's probably not the dynamic playmaker of, as Daniels, but I think his experience does – do some good things for that offense. Um, uh, they run it most of the time. I mean, they, their run rate is top 10 in the country, but their passing game is very efficient and very good and explosive. Um, and, and Bean is part of that. I think he, he does a good job throwing the ball until they seem to get in crunch situations sometimes and he throws it to the other team. But, yeah, you know, that's something K-State's going to have to try to create on our defensive end side. But, yeah, I, the offense is – gives me the biggest pause in what KU can do. And Devin Meal's playmaking ability is, is pretty impactful. And they've got some receivers that can make plays as well. So that'll be uh, what we, what I'll be looking for next week as we go into that game. All right, let's roll on college football outsider time. Take a look at the Big 12 scores from week 11. It was uh, uh, quite the weekend. So, uh, Fan, I'll let you start off. What was your, your biggest takeaway outside of K-State and Baylor around the Big 12 from this weekend? Well, I mean – you, not necessarily UCF beating Oklahoma State, but destroying them by the margin they did and, and Oklahoma State not really even competing in that game. Um, what stood out to me, um, I, would, I would say Iowa State's margin of victory of B, over BYU surprised me as well. Um, KU getting beat, but, but that, that margin of UCF over Oklahoma State and just destroying them in the bounce house with their space uniforms was pretty impressive. Some yeah, I mean, those were good. Uh, those were those were getting some good looks and uh, maybe some slight confusion uh, for people. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I I think that the biggest takeaway is definitely UCF just 
smacking Oklahoma State around. As somebody that was uh, at, at the Tuesday presser telling everybody that UCF was going to win that game, I feel <laughs> I feel very vindicated that they came out and just beat the crap out of Oklahoma State. Uh, I mean, the other kind of big thing that had me a little worried with potential tiebreaker scenarios last night was Texas does not know how to play four quarters. No. Like, <laughs> They completely fell apart in the fourth quarter, and at, when TCU made it a three-point game, I, I honestly thought they were that Texas was going to lose. So I mean, I, right, Texas is still gettable even with Quinn Ewers at quarterback. Um, shout out to Cincinnati to for making it so every Big Twelve team has a win. Houston is the weirdest team in the league by far. Yeah, I was already like giving Houston credit i was like yeah they're, they're they, they might make a bowl game like all this is going to work out in their favor and uh they just kind of proved me wrong there i thought that uh that next week's game was going to be uh pretty or in a couple of weeks was gonna be big for them in ucf uh now it may still be uh, ucf all of a sudden is in a position where they could go to a bowl game after looking like they were dead in the water they play at texas tech and then against houston to finish the year so um i think to me honestly my biggest surprise was not that Iowa State beat BYU, but that it was such a blowout and Iowa State dominated that game. And the other like, really kind of fascinating thing about that is if you watch that game last night, you're looking around and you start to say to yourself, man, this Abu Sama guy, he's impressive. He's like, this, this is a guy you should worry about. Last week he only he he did he hadn't played since October 28th. He had not had a carry since October 28th. And the usage on him has been so up and down and just kind of random that uh I, I don't know what the thought is, but he ran hard, and that's a guy that if he's going to to get an increased role, now you got to be a little bit aware of that at K State. So people are probably confused, like why hadn't this guy been playing at all? I because Matt Campbell's just a weirdo uh with how he <laughs> decides to use guys. And then I mean, Cincinnati and Houston is another one that blows my mind because I thought that that was a slam dunk for Houston. I really started to give Dana Holgerson at least some credit and thought that he would come through. He didn't, was not interested in, uh, in you know, I guess saving the day and trying to fight for bull eligibility because I don't think that they'll win in Stillwater next week. Uh, wouldn't expect that. But who knows? I also thought Oklahoma would bounce back after they flirted with danger against UCF and uh, they didn't. So maybe Oklahoma State comes out flat again. Um, but those are the ones that you know kind of stand out to me. I wasn't really overly surprised by anything else that happened. Um, the Texas thing, it's the most predictable thing ever. They, they're going to use all that talent in the world that they have, get their lead, and then they're just going to shut it down and they're going to go brain dead for about 30 minutes. And maybe they'll find it at the end. Maybe, maybe not, but most of the time they kind of hang on there. So uh, that that one doesn't necessarily surprise me, although I do think TCU isn't very good. So, uh, all I, right. Oh, go ahead, Drew. Oh, I, I will say there there is a funny cork right now with uh, the Big Twelve standings. Eight teams have four or more league wins, but then the bottom six all have two or less. Nobody's at three. It's all either you have four or more, or you have two or less. <laughs> it's it's a it's a it's a league of haves and have nots currently uh this season so it's it is weird to see how this year has worked out and i think this probably it becomes the norm with more teams in the league unbalanced schedules we're going to continue to see stuff like this take place uh throughout the big 12 all right let's uh move on real quick speaking of those big 12 standings uh k-state now in a four-way tie for second place with oklahoma state oklahoma iowa state uh texas still a game ahead of everybody do either of you have a grasp on the Big 12 title game scenarios? Because all let me give my take on it. I do not care right now because I had kind of written off that possibility. And when you need all this other help, I'm just like, you know, go do your own thing. And if after next weekend, there's a clear path that makes sense, like I'll root for it, I'll be all over it. But I could care less about the Big 12 title game scenarios right now. It really does not impact me one way or the other. Uh, and I think that's probably the approach that Chris Kleiman and the team has. But if either of you have this, you feel like down, you can explain it because I know that there are people out there that are very interested in it. 
Well, I, I don't know if there's supposed to be a comma or if it's in the right place in the multi-team ties tiebreaker from the official website because it says, if not, comma, every tied team has played each other, comma, go to step two. So it, it sounds like that if you have three or four teams tied and they haven't all played each other equally, they're going to record against the next highest place common opponent, which is number two on the list. And if you have two teams tied to their next place, you look at your record against those two teams before tie-breaking those two teams. So my understanding is if, if we would tie with Oklahoma and Oklahoma State, since we did not play Oklahoma, the rationale, and a lot of people don't like it because they would say, well, Oklahoma State beat both of us. But in a round-robin schedule, that's fine and dandy. If In a non-round-robin schedule, it's, you have to not only look at who you beat, but who you lose to. So you are going to, if you, if you don't play each other in a, in a three-way tie, you can't, the, the fairness aspect kind of goes out the window and says, well, you lost to a team that won one game in the league or two games in the league, which Oklahoma State did. So that, in my opinion, means that if we, we K-State has to have basically a three-way tie or a four-way tie. If they have a four-way tie, with Texas, Oklahoma, and Oklahoma State, K State's wearing home jerseys in Arlington, from what I could see. If there's a three-way tie with Oklahoma and Oklahoma State, K State uh, is likely going to Arlington, from what I see. Um, if KU and Iowa State tie for sixth, and that's kind of the second key cog in this, is that KU and Iowa State have to tie, because we're assuming again, Mason, you're probably right. I've looked ahead into it probably more than you did, <laughs> but. Uh, <laughs> If we beat those two teams, then we'll have a 2-0 and record against them, and Oklahoma and Oklahoma State would both be 1-1 one and one against them, which would give us the nod. So it's, it's a weird thing, but it's, it's the world of a non-round robin schedule. I mean, it's not yeah. always going to look fair on paper because you have to account for if you don't all play each other, don't go lose to bad teams. That's part of the equation too. Yeah. Uh, so here's here's kind of the the – oddity in that like what you're saying where the teams have to be uh tied shout out to, to m red and b-ball not nothing i love i love his work he is uh he's a savior when it comes to to conference tournaments and now apparently he's trying to save uh football for the big 12 and and everybody's sanity if you go in and just plug it out so how everything played out this weekend in the big 12 you're good and then next weekend we we all think ou beats byu we think that texas beats iowa state we, you know, for the sake of this exercise, we say K-State beats KU and then everything else goes the way we think it does. Then the following week, same type of deal, like where KU beats Cincinnati um, and K-State beats Iowa State, then yeah, it's, it shows that K-State would go based on their winning percentage against the number 16s. But if KU were to lose to Cincinnati in Nippert Stadium, it flips it all around and Oklahoma apparently gets the, yeah. the, the nod. Like it is, it's weird how it works. It is an issue with this scheduling format, and it's honestly what's going to cause headaches for when there are you know 16 teams in the Big 12 mm -hmm. next season, and you're trying to figure it out, and you don't have divisions, so instead you're going around and you're just trying to to make sense of it. With uh, all right, these are your two best teams. I I get why divisions aren't happening anymore, but it's <laughs> it's almost like you kind of need them to. Uh, for if you're going to continue to do conference championships, because you're going to have a lot of teams that look around and go, well, this isn't fair. Like we can all agree if K State, Oklahoma, and Oklahoma State finish at the top, it would, in theory, you could easily say, all right, this isn't fair. Oklahoma State beat both of them. But I do like what you said. Don't lose the bad teams. And do you want to reward your, your teams that? Okay, yeah, you lost tight. You lost one score games to good teams, but you kicked everybody that was bad's butt. Or do you want Oklahoma State, who they've gotten up and they've beaten K State and Oklahoma State, but they've lost to Iowa State and UCF now? How do you want to grade those? And uh, I, I think that's fair, and I, that's why ultimately nobody could really complain on if you get left out. Everybody had their opportunities, and they mm -hmm. blew them in some fashion. And now you're just leaving it up to the wacky format and style that the big 12 has out there, which I am with you. 
I read the explanations a lot over the last <laughs> two years. They don't make any sense. And I, maybe I'm just stupid and that very well could be true. A lot of people are probably nodding their head like, yeah, you're just an idiot, but they are confusing as all get out. And that's why I'm not worrying about any big 12 title game scenarios for K state until after next weekend. And honestly, I probably won't worry about them until the conference tells me next Saturday night, uh, the last day of the regular season, like, all right, these are our two teams going to Arlington. And, uh, I'll just wait until DY tells me uh, if I need to be ready to go to Texas or not the first week into December. So that's how I'm playing it. I honestly, for everybody's sanity, it's probably the best way to take it too. Just, just focus one game at a time. Don't look too far right. out on the schedule. Focus on KU. This is a big one this week. Yeah, yes, I, because we I, we all know fan synergy makes a difference in games on yep, Saturday. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's true. Well, I did think after. Uh, I talked all that crap on Dave Aranda. I was like, man, what if he comes back <laughs> in this game and wins? And then uh, somebody would have been like, oh, this is on you. This is on you. <laughs> like uh, the, the week, the two weeks leading up to the Oklahoma State game where I was just like, they are bad. They are terrible. Uh, I was – I went on – I Drew, be careful this week. I know you're going mm -hmm. on K-Nation today. Uh, I went on it leading up to the Oklahoma State game, and I just relentlessly – said how bad I thought Oklahoma State was. And now it's my fault that K-State has that loss on their resume. So, I'll, I'll gas KU up for everybody. There you go. There you go. That, that'll that do you some good. Like, I've, I've played with the tiebreaker scenarios, too. And, like, the, the math isn't, like, working in my head whenever I do it. So I'm more of, like, a tell me who to root for, and I'll root for them. I was rooting for those clones last night. Yeah, I that one that was one last night where I was kind of like, well, do I have to? I I'm okay with, <laughs> with BYU winning that game or whatever. Um, if, it, if it comes down to everybody having to root for KU uh, the last week of the regular season, that that'll be interesting. Yeah, the good news is I don't think it'll matter. I think Cincinnati is that bad, uh, <laughs> but I, I probably just jinxed that game, and Cincinnati <laughs> now probably finds a way to win <laughs> in some miracle. All right, uh, let's roll on, finish things out. One question for next week. Uh, I drew, you don't get to go first this time because you commented on how easy it was to go first last week. So a uh, fan, you get the, the first crack, uh, at the question of the week. I, my, my question is, is can KU's defense slow K state's offense down? Cause I think that's really the key to the game. Um, I don't think their defense is very good, although they've played better the last two, two weeks and have had some moments and have forced turnovers to win games. And those are all factors in, in, in winning games. You know, you know, K State's won 14 straight now um, by an average score of 41 to 15. So um, it's probably not going to be that margin. But um, will K State's offense be able to move the ball and score at will on on what is, in my opinion, one of the bottom four or five defenses in this league? Uh, I'll stick with the my usual answer about quarterback play. And it's kind of the question of the week, I think, has to be, like, what, what is Jason Bean's status going into the game Saturday? Because I'm not sure if you can rely on Jalen Daniels being healthy for KU. And if, if Ballard is playing for KU, I think that it kind of takes a little bit of the juice of the game away. I mean, and I know that we didn't really talk about uh, how the game ended up being uh, scheduled for 6 o'clock on FS1. But at one point, it looked like it could have been big noon. And you wonder how much the, the injury to Bean and uh, just KU losing yesterday kind of played a factor into that. Uh, yeah, look, it, it's weird. KU has uh, seven quarterbacks on their roster. And is it – I mean, it's, it's odd to me. Is it weird to you guys that after Daniels and Bean, then the third string is a true freshman walk-on? Uh, that like they don't have anybody else that could step up in that role that they they don't think like could maybe do something for them. That is a bit odd. Uh, but they also, I mean, they they have multiple. Uh, they have three freshman quarterbacks and two sophomore quarterbacks on the roster. So I don't know. I don't know what to tell you. Look for me. I I think this game is about not giving any momentum early to KU. I mean that this is going to be the most <laughs> pro KU crowd for a Sunflower showdown that we've seen in a long time. 
Um, I mean, in, in my lifetime of any K-State KU game I've been to, I've never been to a game where I felt like KU fans were really into it and that it was a, a scary environment. I can tell you, and from my experience at the booth uh, on a Friday night watching them play Illinois, I was impressed by the environment and the atmosphere. It was the first time I'd ever seen KU win in that building. I've sure. seen about five losses to K-State and one to West Virginia. But they, I saw them win, and like it can be a real deal thing. And you think about last year's KU game. We knew that KU's offense was something to be weary of and that they could hang if you gave them the chance. K-State had a punt on that first drive, and they lucked out that Ty Zentner hit a bomb of a punt. It was wet, and KU muffed it and gave K-State the early momentum and made the mistake. Mm -hmm. K-State has to go out and start fast and get after it early and give zero momentum. So even if you don't score on your first drive of the game, Make sure you hold KU or you don't give up a big play and for sure avoid any disastrous turnover in, in, on that first drive or the first you know couple of minutes of the game. Because if that happens, that, thing, that place will get loud. And as we've known, K-State has struggled on the road this year. That's well documented. Some have gone out of their way to say that this is a soft team because K-State has struggled on the road. So... I think it's going to be fascinating, but that's my big thing. Can you start fast and avoid that early mistake that gives a ton of momentum to KU and the crowd, which is going to be, I mean, they will be unhinged if something good happens to KU first in that game because it's been a long time since that's happened. So that's uh, what I'm keeping my eye on, and we'll see. I mean, I, if K-State goes out there, they play clean, they should be able to win that game. Because the teams that have lost to KU this year, the sole reason for it is they haven't played a clean game. Mm -hmm. And we'll see ultimately uh, where things end up working out for them. But that's uh, that's where I go with my question of the week. Any other thoughts from you guys before we skedaddle and uh, shift our focus to basketball tomorrow night against South Dakota State? Quick turnaround. Yeah. Yeah, th three games in four days. We're, we're working hard over here. <laughs> Uh, score predictions for tomorrow night against South Dakota State, who uh, obviously a, a good team in the Summit League over the last few seasons. I, I don't think that they are as good this year as they've been in past years, but I still think that they are uh, probably one of the better uh, like buy games that K-State will have. Well, they, they do have the Summit preseason player of the year from Lawrence, Kansas, Zeke Mayo. And uh, I do think K-State wins, but I think South Dakota State's picked to win that league and they'll be pretty good. Um, I'd say 70 to 60 cats. I was going to go like 75, 66 cats. Are you guys aware that South Dakota State lost to Akron to start the season? Okay. Akron, Akron's good. Yeah. Uh, are we just saying that because they're, they're, they're better than what we expect? I mean, eh, Akron, whatever. Uh, I, I think K State probably wins. It's probably similar to how I think a lot of these non con games are going to go. They will have a stretch where they snag the lead and then it's just like kind of letting the clock bleed out and you're hoping that you hang on in some way. I, I think that there's a lot of growth that has to happen on this team right now for them to be able to put teams away. But I'll, I'll go ahead and uh, say K-State wins the game. They'll get back into the 80s. I'm going to say K-State 81, South Dakota State 74. That's my That's my final score. So win the game get a handful of days off, and then everybody's focus will go to the Bahamas. Uh, and that'll be three games in three days. We'll go yeah. Providence Friday, KU football Saturday, and then uh, maybe the, the the revenge game with Nigel Pack, even though absolutely nobody on the roster played with Nigel Pack. So <laughs> uh, that'll, be, that'll be fun to see. But all right, that will do it for us here on the KSO Show. Be sure to stay tuned with everything else going on over at On3 and K-State Online. Head over there, get signed up. You can be a part of everything we have, whether it's recruiting coverage, obviously football and basketball in big spots right now. And then, uh, yeah, you can sound off on the message boards and fire off your steaming hot takes from K-State's pathetic 59-25 to 25 <laughs> win over you know Baylor and their their terrible quarterback play that now has the all time touchdown record at K State. Uh, it was honestly it wasn't even that good of a weekend for K State football. So I don't know what everybody was smiling about last night. They need to they really need to turn it on. Maybe score sixty next week. I don't know. Um, I, I I was thinking like 
people were still asking for coaches grades uh, in the game thread from the game. And I'm like, okay, well, if you want me to give a negative grade to the coaches when they win by 34 and they score 59 points, what does a good game look like? Like, does Con Klein have to go out and put up 75 points for you to get, be like, okay, he did his job this week, guys. He was good. Like, things were fine. Things were fine. And I'm sure people were probably like, well, actually, the offense only scored 45 of the points. Yes, you're right. Bad game, Colin. Pick it up. Uh, sorry if I offend anybody for being a little snippy with you, but man, it was a big win 59 25. Enjoy it. And uh, let's uh, see the Cats win another one against KU this weekend because I can't live in a world, my daughter can't live in a world where K State has a losing record to KU. Hasn't happened in my lifetime, so can't happen in hers. Uh, Cats need to get on a, a, a good start with uh, her life. All right, for Drew, for Fan, I'm Mason. We will be back next Sunday, good or bad, to uh, recap the Sunflower Showdown. And then D.Y. and I are here on Monday to go over everything to uh, finish tying the bow on Baylor and look ahead to KU and K-State.